So thank you all for joining us. This is our first session for the day, which is, uh, as uh, Dean Woods mentioned earlier, foc focusing on the themes of around capitalism and around, in particular, uh, the questions of whether there is a crisis in capitalism uh, at this point. Um, uh, the sessions are going to be, uh, with, with the addition of this plenary, are going to uh, include uh, two breakouts, uh, one on the future of work and income, uh, and the other on uh, the societal role, if any, for corporations in addressing uh, what might be uh, at issue with capitalism today. Um, so before we get started, I'd like to very briefly introduce our panelists uh, for today. Uh, there are detailed bios for all of the panelists in your uh, handout. Uh, but uh, to my uh, far left is uh, Mr. Kaushik Chatterjee, who is uh, the group executive director of uh, Tata Steel, and in that capacity uh, oversees uh, not only the largest conglomerate, uh, uh, one of the largest conglomerates in India, but uh, Tata, the Tata Group is also, I believe, the largest manufacturing employer here in the UK. So uh, welcome, Kaushik. Thank you. Um, to, in, in the middle is uh, Ms. Geraldine Buckingham, who is the head of strategy at uh, BlackRock. And uh, Geraldine is going to contribute to us uh, uh, some of the perspectives that BlackRock, which is one of the world's largest asset management firms, has been taking to address uh, some of these very deep and structural issues that we hope to be tackling today. And uh, to my immediate left, uh, and I should perhaps uh, create some space here, is the woman that the New York Times has described as the most dangerous woman in China. Um, <laughs> Hu Xu Li is uh, the editor-in-chief of Kaixin magazine. And Kaixin, as, as those of you who are familiar with China will know, is uh, sort of like the Economist magazine there. It is known for its pioneering uh, um, co co coverage of issues around uh, corporate governance, corporate fraud, uh, and more broadly around questions about political account accountability. And uh, Xu Li has uh, very deftly managed the fine line between keeping a magazine like uh, Kaixin going uh, and continually pushing the boundaries for uh, what's possible and what's accountable in a country like China. So welcome, Xu Li. So as we've heard from uh, the Vice Chancellor and uh, Dean Woods, uh, in the U.S. and the U.K. in particular, uh, but also in the Western world more generally, there seems to be um, a climate of mistrust, uh, mistrust particularly with uh, the very basic institutions uh, of our society. Uh, the recent uh, Edelman Trust Barometer that was released for 2017 reports that as many as 60% of uh, Britons and Americans uh, think that, quote unquote, the system is not working. And of course, the system is defined very primitively to include elements like capitalism and democracy, at least since uh, the end of World War II. Um, and these data suggest that the distrust or the mistrust in uh, the system is particularly acute uh, amongst the young. So a recent survey published in the Journal of Democracy says that amongst the 1980s birth cohort in the U.S., uh, only 70 per, or 70 percent, over 70 percent, uh, do not believe it is essential to live in a democracy, which is astounding. Um, and uh, that number for the 1930s birth cohort was somewhere around 30 percent. So we've seen a gradual decline in the credibility of democracy over time. Uh, in Europe, that decline has been less dramatic, but only because we started from a lower base. So the 1930s birth cohort in, US, in Europe uh, reported trust in democracy at about 50%, and the levels currently for the 1980s cohort is around 40%. Um, the news for capitalism is uh, just as um, unpromising. So amongst uh, US citizens aged 18 to 29, a 2016 survey from the Institute of Politics at the Kennedy School found uh, only 42% support capitalism as a way of organizing economic society. Uh, support for socialism in the same group was at 33%. And again, this is data from the United States. Um, so the data seem to suggest that there is, in fact, a, a decline in trust. 
But behind these uh, statistics on trust are also some very real data about income inequality, uh, which uh, many of us have been fam made familiar with, with the works of uh, Thomas Piketty, Emmanuel Saez, and uh, Branko Milanovic, amongst others. Um, and, and inequality is not simply the fact of the rich getting richer. It uh, is perhaps more disturbingly the fact that real incomes for the middle and the uh, poor, the middle class and the poor, uh, are stagnating or, and or declining. So uh, from the 1980s through uh, 2015, we've seen actual declines in real income, uh, particularly for the bottom 20 percentile of the U.S. population. And uh, uh, for the 20th to the 60th percentile of the U.S. population, real incomes have more or less stagnated over that period. So there's some uh, pretty damaging data behind this. So Geraldine, I'd love to start with you. And, and, and with a simple question, does capitalism have a trust problem? And is that justified? Sure. So firstly, if I could just say thank you very much for having me uh, to the school. Uh, but thank you very much for including us in the discussion today. I mean, is, is capitalism broken? I would say firmly no. That doesn't mean that it's not fairly troubled. Um, and I think that uh, the challenge is, I think we need to reflect on the fact that capitalism has created, uh, you know, has generated extraordinary growth around the world and, and lifted enormous numbers of people out of poverty. The problem is, I think, that we've lost a little bit of the collective benefit of capitalism and people feel that the benefits of capitalism are now being distributed in a way that is manifestly unfair. Um, and I think that uh, despite the accent, I live in America, I have lived in the US for the last 10 years, and there's a very, very prevailing sense of anger, particularly post-financial crisis, that, that uh, capitalism got us into this problem, uh, capitalism itself got out of the problem, but a lot of people on Main Street, as it's characterised in the US, are still feeling the very real consequences of some of those decisions. Um, and so I do think trust has been compromised. Having said that, I think that this is obviously a very difficult problem. Um, we would have solved, if it, solved it if it wasn't. And it's very multifactorial. I think it's not just income inequality. I think it's other things, like, and you picked up on this with the age point. I think a lot of young people, not just in the US but around the world, feel like the social contract's been written in a way that is unfair against them. Will they be able to afford an education? Will they ever be able to get out of student debt? Will they be able to afford a home? Will the public programs and pensions that they contribute to be there when they retire? Um, you know, will the environment be one which them and their children can comfortably live in? I think these are very real questions. So we're also seeing a tension intergenerationally, which I think is, is adding to this. And that's just one additional example of um, why I think people are very, are very angry. So I think that we need to make sure we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. I think that there are things about capitalism that we obviously want to continue to embrace and nurture. But I do think we need to look very much at this notion of the collective benefit versus the individual benefit and try and return some of these communities and societies to a view where there is greater collective benefit of the wealth creation, whether it's through investment in social programs, uh, whether it's through investment in education, healthcare, housing, these kind of critical, uh, critical social programs, um, and that people don't feel that capitalism has run rampant. I think another factor that I would want to just highlight is that particularly in the country in which I live, I think the notion of the influence of big money on the political discourse, uh, and in the US we've had very frank things like the Citizens United decision that meant that big money could influence uh, the political discourse far more explicitly than it had previously. Um, and we've now been through one or two elections where that decision has had impact, and you literally see the billions of dollars, and I'm not exact, I mean, it's literally billions with a B <laughs> that is driving the political process, and I think that's one that makes people feel very shut out, um, and one which I think you saw not just through the election of Trump, but also the financial support of someone like Bernie Sanders, which was about small donations, millions, millions of times over, um, frustration with that. So I think this is a very multifactorial problem, and therefore one that's going to be difficult to pull apart. But I do think it's important that we not lose sight of the fact that capitalism can and has generated growth and wealth, um, and that we shouldn't necessarily be dismissive of that. But we do need to think about some of the consequences it's having second, third, fourth order implications, which I think are getting very severe. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, Kaushik, I'd like to turn to you, and in particular, um, you know, I, I mentioned these data from, from Edelman about trust in the system, and I said that 60% uh, of average Britons and Americans believe the system is not working. Edelman also surveyed people in India, and the result is perhaps just the opposite. More than 70% of average Indians trust the system. 
You operate in both these environments. What's different about it? Why is, why is this working in India in a way that it seems to have stagnated here in the West? So um, good morning to all of you, and uh, thank you uh, for inviting me here. Um, I think we see a contrasting world um, between the developed world and the developing world. In the developing world, life lives on hope uh, because there's so much to do. And uh, it's important to understand that the demographics play a big role in creation of that hope. When you have a population which is the average age is um, about 35 to 40, uh, and you have in the next 20 years about 30 to 40 percent of uh, the population which will move into being the productive class because uh, of the size. Um, it lives on hope because of two things, because of the opportunities they expect that they will get in the country, uh, the kind of opportunities that the country needs to seize to compete against others in this world. And uh, therefore, when the political class stands up uh, and seeks mandate to govern, it's built on that hope. And if you have a leader or a government which promises that uh, to, be, to ensure that there is a contemporariness in that hope, um, obviously the trust levels increase. Um, and I think uh, what is important is in this world where we are connected through social media, through internet and everything, even the young boy or a girl uh, in a village uh, in, in India knows what's happening around the world. A few months back um, in one of our uh, facilities, which is actually at the one of the remotest and backward uh, places of eastern India. We had a bunch of young girls who actually have become what they call as Google friends. And they download um, stuff from the internet about recipes of making homemade jams and jellies and pickles and uh, have given these to the uneducated mothers and aunts in that village. And they have come about making those stuff and are selling them and becoming bread earners for the family. Now this is an example where connectivity in this world can be leveraged to create uh, productivity. Otherwise, uh, that household was living on traditional very small, ineffective, unproductive farming. So that's an example, a very small example of the hope that you create. And that hope creates the kind of confidence in the, in the governance. Uh, not that things are being fixed. I'm just saying these are uh, individual initiatives where they find that between the effort and the result, there is some connectivity. And if you now multiply it to a billion people, it's a collective hope and a collective uh, faith that we can together do something. Capitalism in India is also a bad word because uh, capitalism in, in a developing country means that it's often linked to crony capitalism. Mm. It's often linked to uh, situation which only creates the divide. Uh, and uh, if you have a significant population of people who are below the poverty line, how do you create the faith in capitalism? Which is why um, initiatives that the government has to take has to create a capability beyond just traditional capitalism or the capitalist way of looking at life. Which is why if in recent years, you have uh, programs launched by the government, which is of skilling people. So it's a skill in India program, or uh, enabling and adopting the digital world to say digital India. Uh, and these are programs which are actually touching the imagination of those who are disenfranchised 
and saying you can be part of this journey. So there are people, unlike in the US, where the entrepreneurial dream is not very prevalent because of the significant working middle class who would typically want to get a job, a professional degree, and move on. We have a spirit of entrepreneurism which is coming into India, and that's what is being facilitated by the current government. So it is not surprising that you have these kind of initiatives which you are actually connecting with the people who in the rest of the world are feeling disenfranchised and saying uh, you can be part of this whole process. So it doesn't mean, doesn't matter in some ways that the, uh, the rich is becoming richer so long as the poor is also becoming less poor and, and is getting more self-sufficient and can chase their ambition. So I think the studies that you're talking about are effectively capturing that imagination. If I contrast that with my experience in the UK, and we, run, we are an old world industry as far as the developed world is concerned, steel is normally dirty, nobody touches it, you know. Um, but if you really look at, uh, in the UK, jobs in any country uh, has to be those which can actually create products and goods which then ensures that the country's productivity increases. UK has perhaps uh, moved on from there and only realizing now that we need manufacturing jobs. We need manufacturing jobs across the spectrum because it's not only the high-tech jobs which will give the numbers to, so to speak. You also have to look at a broader spectrum. Everybody is not the, a professional or an engineer or a scientist. And I think that, that number of jobs is going down. And uh, manufacturing is not being um, pushed to the extent, it's not thought to be strategic. Uh, high tech, uh, higher level of uh, development, innovation is, which is the right thing, but you got to take the masses with you. If you need the largest size of the population to participate in an economy, we need to look at jobs across the spectrum. And if the domestic consumption and demand does not uh, become robust, then manufacturing competitiveness also goes down. So it's a cycle which is, uh, which is not an overnight fix. It has happened over the last two decades. We, if we need to rewind this, or rewind this into another level, there's a lot of effort that needs to be done. So you have huge pension deficits across the country. I'm told it's a number of about 250 billion pounds. So who works f to keep these pensions going? It's the current worker. And if that current manufacturing setups do not have the competitiveness to compete with the rest of the world, then they would not be able to sustain this. And if they're not be able to sustain this, then you have problems with, say, defined benefit schemes, etc. So this is a virtuous cycle, and we need to address it uh, not with a fixing mindset, but to structurally set some ground rules which will enhance the country competitiveness, which will ensure that the larger working population have faith in the country's economy and hence on the political class, and that's when I think the barometer will reflect uh, a better result. Fantastic. Thank you, Kaushik. Shuli, I'd like to turn to you and the experience that you've had with uh, these issues, particularly from the perspective of building institutions of governance within China. And the data in China, you know, uh, if, uh, uh, if, if we can uh, look at them carefully, suggests that China might be on the cusp of uh, dominating economic activity over the course of the next half century. Um, how do you see these developments from China, and how do you see the challenges within China as it moves in to occupy the space that perhaps the United States enjoyed for the last hundred years? Yeah, when it comes to China, actually, I think the, the picture becomes more complicated. I think about China's economic gap and the corporate inch in the change world. Um, I'd like to say, I'd like to say in the three dimensions, the short, the medium, and the long term. 
for the short term, China's economy has a strong first quarter this year with a robust GDP growth of 6.9%. But starting from April, one key indicator, Caixin PMI, ours actually, purchase and managing index, captured early fund weakness. The trend was further established last month and this month. It's a consensus now that China's economy is slowing. The old engine of export and the government spending are losing steam. But China is not heading to a cliff. Underneath the circle is a transition, a slowly, sometimes painfully, yet firmly switch from the old economy to a new economy. Behind the new economy are two key assumptions, which are pretty obvious today in China. The relative abundance of capital coupled with reduced return rate and the increased labor cost resulted from a turning point of labor surplus. A new balance of growth must be based on human capital and high tech. There is no other way around. Caixin's fudging think tank called Caixin Insight, our new arm, started to compile a new economy index since 2016 to measure the strengths of these new growth agents. We have some very interesting findings. We found out that a third of China's economy belongs to the new economy. Among the biggest contributors are information technology, financial and legal service, and high-ending manufacturing. So the dynamic between the old and the new economy is fascinating. New market-oriented economy Foster, fosters entrepreneurship and the disruptive innovation. That adds new power to further gro future growth. But despite the current slowing down and the ongoing switching gear from the old to the new engine, the outlook of Chinese economy is still quite stable in the near and the medium term. Because the confidence level is actually restoring and the government combination of monetary policy and the fiscal policy are still effective. But the short-term stability can be deceiving. The long-term growth still has a very serious challenge. The fundamental solution is stru structurally reform based on the principles of the market economy. Interestingly, like, like you mentioned, the very formula China has been following successfully in the last 30 decades and I firmly believe is the only right choice for China, has been challenged in the post-financial crisis Western world. In the United States, President Donald Trump is obviously, at least rhetorically, anti-globalization and anti-free trade. Here in the UK, where economic liberalism was fostered and dominated for decades, this fundamental philosophy is also challenged today with Brexit and the policies heavily, heavily influenced by part party politics. So populism is on the rise around the world. Globalization and capitalism are questioned. The pendulum of history might swing back again, but now at this moment, the challenge to globalization is also a challenge to its largest beneficiary, China. The flip side is that that offers opportunities for China too. Chinese President Xi Jinping made it clear in this January in his speech in Davos, a few days before Trump's inauguration, that China will continue economic globalization defend the hard won international systems and agreements, and keeps its door open. His speech echoes the mood of the time. But the pledge is not just sometime, something nice for China to have, but a necessity. To move China's economy to a sustainable growth pace, to avoid falling into the middle income trap, globalization and opening up are the only way forward. We all know it's easier said than done. China has its hands full of domestic economic issues. Yet it will continue making its contribution, and in some areas, providing new possibilities, like Belt and Road Initiative. 
but the challenges China is facing are unprecedented too. After 30 years of reform, low hanging fruits are gone. Future reforms will take place in the toughest areas, affecting many vested interests and taking place amid the change of developed models. China needs to brace up for these challenges and be aware of that window for transition is short. Many of the reforms can only be carried out when the economic growth is relatively strong. So the list of reforms is not short, ranging from closing the income gap, providing better social goods such as education and health care, to the increase of market efficiency by limiting the preferred status of state-owned companies and giving a leveled playing play field to private players. I can pick on casings like SOE reform, and that is very relevant with uh, you t the topic about the corporate governance. But I don't want to exhaust you on the whole issues of China's reform. The key issue is simple. China should continue embracing market economy and moving along the path that has taken it to the current success. Reform and opening up. Even though this concept is challenged in Western world since last year, in China, the problem is not too much of it, but too little. So to sum up, there is short-term economic challenge and the medium-term transition unfolding. But the long-term growth relies on embracing the market economy in China. And it's, it has to be a market economy that fits China. And it has to be an inclusive one with eyes not just on efficiency, but on equality and sustainability. That's our conclusion. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Xu Li. So it appears across our panelists, uh, and I'd like to open this up um, to questions from the audience in a moment, but it appears across our panelists we have, uh, uh, in some sense, in one read, a robust defense of the basic elements of capitalism. Uh, as Geraldine said, we shouldn't throw the baby out with the bathwater. And uh, there is something structurally uh, quite sound about having a capitalist economy, although uh, there might be some concerns about how capitalism has been able to deliver uh, on uh, income inequality or on uh, income uh, growth, uh, particularly amongst, say, the, the lower 50th percentile of the distribution. Um, Kaushik uh, raised a very interesting point about a different in outlook across the two populations. The idea that optimism is more prevalent in, uh, in, in the emerging uh, markets and in countries like India, where there is a demographic advantage to the way people view the challenges. Uh, Shu Li mentions that even in a uh, time where the West might be, and particularly the US and the UK, might be withdrawing themselves from the world, uh, China is going to forge forward into uh, adopting more market-based reforms, but an inclusive form of capitalism, perhaps reimagining the rules of the game along the way. So let's invite the audience to comment or, or ask questions along these, uh, along these very different perspectives that we've heard uh, so far. So uh, we have a question right in the back there. Um, Professor Rothstein, my colleague. Thank you, very interesting. I have a question that is a little terminological. This panel is about the future of capitalism, but a market economy doesn't have to be a capitalistic economy. In a market economy, capital can hire labor, and then capital is deciding over the production. But you can have the opposite. In a market economy, labor can hire capital, and then there is some type of democratic process within the company. And there are a number of very successful such companies. Who are they in China? which is to the largest extent not traded on the stock market, but owned by its employees. There is John Lewis here, the largest and most secure bank in the Nordic country, countries. Handelsbanken is the, the major owner, is uh, their employees. This has two effects. The people who work there are much more satisfied than if they work in a traditional company. And they also get a lot of money because they share the profit. So I'm wondering if you are sort of conflating capitalists with the market economy. Because if you look at capitalists today, people who own capital usually don't have the slightest idea what is going to be produced. It's all in the mindset of the employees. 
So there is a power shift here that is going on. Many new entrepreneurial IT companies have to give their employees shares and influence because that is the only way they can keep them and make them sort of work in the direction that they want to. Geraldine, can I? Oh, I was going to, even you speaking with Mark and Nicole, I was going to refer to Shuley. But, um, but, but can I bring you in sure, just yeah. because from, from your perspective uh, <laughs> at, at, uh, in, in the asset management yeah. industry and in some sense representing the view and the importance of capital in the term capitalism, <laughs> um, could you respond to Professor Rothstein on this? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think there's no doubt both models can work. Even in the industry I work in, we have very successful models of both. So BlackRock is actually the world's largest asset manager and the world's second largest asset manager is a firm called Vanguard, which is a mutual and owned by employees. So I think we can see that uh, both models can work. I don't, necessarily, I don't necessarily think one has to dominate, um, but I do think that the, the creation of value and the equitable distribution of that value has to hold in both models. Um, and I, I would say that I think, I think both models can and, and have demonstrated that they can work. I don't think we have to be all one or, or all the other. Uh, in, actually, in China, we say that we don't discuss about the surname of the list or capitalism or socialism. So we don't consider about the surname. We think about <laughs> the proper model that uh, fits China. Fantastic. Um, and we have a question right here. Um, please uh, uh, just wait for the mic and then, yeah. Thank you very much, Karthik. Thanks for yeah. the uh, incredible uh, opening to the panel. Really interesting discussion. My question is simple. Sorry, Arkan, oh, I'm sorry. Arkan Fung from yes. the Kennedy School. Thank you. I teach politics. Um, my, my question is, is simple. What do each of you regard the role of government as f in fixing capitalism? Kaushik. I, I think uh, the government can play a great facilitator um, in fixing capitalism in, in, in multiple ways. I think if you look at uh, the issues that we face in capitalism, one is short-termism. Short and I think that has been one of the biggest issues, in my view, which has created uh, this whole uh, inequality, the issues relating um, what people perceive as unfair and so on. Because uh, it's not uh, looking at what uh, Professor said. It's not about who owns the capital as to how we can use the capital. Are we the true trustees of the capital for the stakeholders and create value for the stakeholders, which includes the community? So the government here can, uh, can always be the facilitator to ensure that that fairness is, is appropriate from a larger stakeholder perspective. If I look at, uh, and the reason why I say short-termism has been an issue, the entire capital market, uh, including the regulators, have promoted over the years a short-termism, whether it's quarterly earnings, quarterly profits, maximizing on, on shareholder value, um, uh, employee or, or manager's compensation principles, and so on. So there has been a short-termism in this, and I think the government, as the true trustee of the entire country, uh, in a particular country, uh, should actually look at promoting long-termism, uh, using capital for the good of the society, and ensure that the regulatory framework is one of the uh, one of the factors which are put in place, which promotes long-term deployment of capital, and the value created out of that is more equitably available uh, to the larger stakeholder universe, whether it is through the corporate social responsibility or for the deployment of. Uh, capital. And uh, the other thing which I would like to talk about is we often look at capital as only financial capital. In today's world, I think the definition of capital needs to get wider. Um, we're looking at social capital, looking at uh, intellectual capital, looking at natural capital. Climate change is one of the biggest issues, I think, uh, which the governments have to safeguard vis-a-vis -vis, uh, any country or the ecosystem. So I think the, the government can play the check and balance role, and it can also play the facilitating role to ensure that capital is used properly for productive purposes, and the outcome of the same is distributed more equitably. 
Kaushik, if I might just push you on that a little bit. So um, a few years ago, the Indian government required that all large Indian corporations spend, I think, 2% of their uh, net profits on CSR-related activities. And I recall there being a, a, a quite disappointing reaction, to say the least, from uh, the Indian corporate houses on that. So is that an example of the sort of government intervention that we should see or shouldn't see? Could we speak specifically to that one innovation and... Thank you. Yeah, I think it was uh, a very important uh, milestone in the thinking of the government where uh, the government legislated that 2% of the profit before tax of every company um, should be utilized for uh, corporate social responsibility projects. Uh, and there was a freedom given to the companies to define the same and disclose if they are not able to spend the same. And there was a, a, a fund created as the Prime Minister's uh, fund where if somebody did not have the delivery mechanism, they could have simply given it to the government to deploy the same. Yes, it was the first, th first time in the history of corporate India that such an imposition uh, came up. But uh, I think I can talk from a Tata Group perspective. And in about a uh, century back, our founder basically said, what comes from the society must go back to the society. It can go back by way of uh, CSR activity. It can go back by virtue of building more sustainable communities. Um, so we actually are currently, in, in, in the last maybe 20 years or so, have been spending much more than 2%. So we didn't have an issue. Um, but I think many companies uh, found it to be an issue. But end of the day, everybody accepted. And there is a huge amount of uh, uh, initiatives undertaken by several corporates uh, in doing uh, a lot of good work uh, in the country. And the total number could be close to about uh, 2 to $3 billion a year uh, just by aggregating this. So $2 billion of social uh, work and social investment can create a, a, a big change in a country like India. So I think that was innovative. Um, that was uh, also asking the companies, uh, corporates, to be uh, more responsible. And, uh, and therefore, 2% of PBT is, uh, is not a very significant number from, uh, from a growing economy perspective. So you're saying you grow, there's absolutely no problem, but be responsible enough to spend it uh, in, in meaningful projects. And I think that's a, a wonderful position of facilitation, as an example. Geraldine, would you like to yeah. see the government take a larger role? Yeah, in I mean, personally, I, I think there are two things, and I agree with a huge amount of what you said. I think short-termism is actually one of the greatest challenges um, in the capitalist framework. The two things I'd highlight, the first is I do think regulation is very, very important. Um, you know, people respond to the incentives that are there. And just one particular example is, this will sound very dry, but even the accounting treatment of how investment in training and learning is treated for big companies in the US is not one that encourages them to invest. It basically comes out of the p &L. It doesn't get amortised the way other long-term investments would be. And as a result, a lot of companies, just from a simple p &L point of view, are going to be less uh, willing to invest in learning and training. I do think, and obviously this leads into sort of some of the issues around the future of work, the need, the need for lifelong learning and therefore the need for retraining is absolutely critical. And I think pri the private sector can and should play a huge role in doing that. And certainly a number of the largest corporations in the U US, you know, I'd highlight ones like AT&T are stepping up and saying we are going to invest literally, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars. I can tell you at BlackRock it's becoming one of the biggest strategic issues for us is how do we keep training our workforce. Um, and so I think that we need to look at even things like that, which seem very mundane and very dry, but actually will have real implications on corporate behaviour. I also then personally, uh, and I'm looking at Nairi when I say this, because she and I have discussed this at length, I think the government has a huge role to play in redistribution. And I, I do think that, um, you know, how we, how we levy taxation, whether it's things like the Indian example, um, both of corporations and of individuals who have been fortunate enough to do better than other members of the community is incredibly important. I think we do need to continue to invest in critical areas like uh, healthcare, like education, like housing. Um, and I think that the tremendous value that's being generated in the private sector can and should be redistributed to some, you know, to some extent to do that. Uh, and I think that's, that's a role of government to play and comes back to what I was saying in my opening remarks about having a collective solution to these problems um, and not making it necessarily every man or woman for themselves, which, you know, in, in to some extent is the ultimate short-term 
uh, approach, which is it'll, it'll be beneficial in the short term, but certainly not have the long-term social outcomes that we want to see. So those are two areas where I think government can and should play a, a critical role. Obviously, uh, picking up on what David said earlier when we talk about the productivity of government, the flip side, of course, is then that people want to see that government is, you know, using this, this investment wisely. Um, and so I think there's obviously, you know, pressure on both sides of that equation uh, to deliver for the outcomes that people would like to see. Fantastic. Shu Li. I think, of course, the role of government is important, but in, on the, in the context of China, especially economic area, uh, the real challenge is uh, to have the role of government smaller uh, and to have the market mechanism work well and to unleash its power, potential power. Uh, in China, I think the real challenge is government try to put its hand in every area where we should have a market to work better. Of course, uh, at the same time, the government has its own role to play. And uh, so what we suggest and we always uh, discuss about and uh, put a lot of comments is uh, do the right thing the government do, the right thing, and don't do the thing you should not do. Do the thing you should do. That is what we said about. Fantastic. Thank you. Yes. Uh, do you, have, you still have your mic on, Nairi? No. <laughs> or otherwise we wait for Yes. Great. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to hear a little bit more on the short-termism issue that both Koshik and Geraldine have, have mentioned, because it, it feels, I think, to many of us that, that in the corporate sector, you know, CEOs average um, tenure less than five years, shares traded, you know, 60% of shares traded several times a day, quarterly dividends, the constant relentless push. Um, it, it, it feels like an environment in which battling the short-termism is difficult. And I know BlackRock and actually McKinsey's have done a lot of work on long-term capitalism. So why, my first question is, where have you had traction on that? Because it feels to me that the CEOs like Paul Poulsen and Unilever, who have actually tried to take long-term decisions, are now accused of having taken their eye off the ball and not kept their eye on the shareholders and such like. But I think the other side of it is that the, the side of government that Karthik has brought out is that political systems seem trapped into short-termism as well, with politicians looking at the three or four or five-year election cycle. And so it, it feels, you know, sometimes like a perfect storm of short-termism, where China is the complete outlier because it's, it's neither its state-owned enterprises nor its government are locked into the same short-term cycles. So, so where has there been traction on long-term capitalism? Where have we actually seen things change that will make a longer-term vision possible? And if they haven't, where do you think we're going to see change? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a bit of a, it's a, bit of a mixed bag. I mean, uh, I, I, won't, I won't bore you with the, uh, the history of BlackRock, but um, in some regards, we actually have, we experience both sides of the equation. So BlackRock was founded in 1988, and we still have the founder as the CEO. And I think he has operated in a way which actually has had extraordinary long-term vision. Um, we, also, we also operate, most of the money that we invest is on behalf of retirees, and therefore that money also has a very long-term outlook um, because if you're going to retire in 20 years, you know, what happens in the French election doesn't actually matter to your investment portfolio. But we've now gotten into, we've now gotten into this mindset where people feel they need to pull their money out, put it in you know, the days before elections or after because it's going to have a significant impact on their portfolio. And it will in the near term. It will, it will have much less of an impact over the longer term. So I think that um, Larry and BlackRock has, along with McKinsey, taken a very firm stance on the need for us to be more long term. We see all sorts of short term behaviour, quarterly earnings, share buybacks, dividends. Um, there's, there's overwhelming evidence that corporations have become more short term focused. I think where we have had traction is actually in elevating the dialogue. I don't think this was an issue that was being talked about at all um, five, six, seven years ago. And I do think even some of the facts you quote about CEO tenure, etc., are now much, much more in the public discourse. The reality is the market, though, and regulators, I, I do highlight them again, do still um, require, certainly encourage, in many cases require things like a quarterly earnings statement. You have started to see asset managers. Some have started to move away and said that they will only do full earnings twice a year. They will do assets, asset levels quarterly. I would say BlackRock has not done that, um, and certainly, you know, even itself as a firm. And we continue to get um, a lot of both analyst and regulator pressure to continue to, to report quarterly. So I think that um, the, the dialogue has been elevated, but I don't think we've yet seen enough 
action from a, you know, a range of corporations um, to actually meaningfully change this. Again, it's a very multifactorial problem because, I, as I said, it's also things like how people are managing money. So the average holding term for a mutual fund uh, 20 years ago was eight years, and today it's two and a half, which just means that people are churning money incredibly quickly. Um, and as you said, CEOs who are now in place for four years, um, stocks that are being traded very fre frequently, it's very difficult for firms to strike out and, and take a long-term bet. You do see examples. I mean, it's interesting. The year that Apple launched the iPhone, their share price went down 25%. Um, and 10 years later, uh, obviously, I think everyone would agree that was a good investment. The question is, could they have done it without a CEO, an iconic CEO like Steve Jobs, who had, um, who had the sort of support of the market and belief that he ultimately had a long-term innovation mindset? I think realistically, and I don't know what the group would think, I, I think it would have been very hard. Um, and so we're not yet seeing enough reward. We need to be amplifying those stories like the Apple one I just told um, so that people can see the long-term benefit is there. But I don't think we've yet had enough traction is the short answer. So, Geraldine, let yeah. me just um, push you a little on yeah. this. Um, so uh, when I was a PhD student 15 years ago, uh, we were taught about the Wall Street rule. The idea that if you don't like what management is doing, you sell the stock. And this goes back to sort of, you know, the, the legendary philosophy, uh, investment philosophy of people like Graham and Dodd. And, um, and just a couple of weeks ago, BlackRock uh, went uh, on the offensive with Exxon. Yeah. Uh, in and particular, and Occidental, yeah. yes, yeah. and Occidental, in particular, with respect to their disclosures on climate change. So, is is the Wall Street rule dead? I mean, the the perspective of the Wall Street rule was that the common sense, the judgment resides with management, mm -hmm. and let them do what they have to yeah, do. This is, but yeah. now we're seeing some sort of activism well, here. Yeah, so, well, really, yeah. this is a really interesting issue. So, again, BlackRock today manages five point six trillion dollars of assets. About half of that is passively held. So we buy index, we buy indices. We don't determine what's in the index. So, for example, if you're going to buy the FTSE 100, you buy the, the, the stocks that are in the FTSE 100. We don't decide what those 100 stocks should be. What it means is, in many regards, we're actually the ultimate long-term investor because we don't have the option to sell the stock because it's in the index and, therefore, we are going to hold on to the stock. We've traditionally had an a, had a approach. Um, we have a very large uh, investment stewardship operation that operates somewhat independently in the company in that it basically operates BlackRock as shareholder, not BlackRock Inc. as a firm, um, and basically uh, makes proxy votes. And uh, we have, we've traditionally taken more of an approach where we have worked very, very hard with management behind the scenes to basically influence management outcomes. Um, and we had, we had rarely voted against management. I think we've felt as issues like climate change have become more and more pressing and we haven't seen the management response that we want, um, we have started to vote publicly um, against management. I don't think that the Wall Street rule is dead, but I do think that the increased scrutiny on how long-term asset owners like BlackRock um, are using that shareholder, the, the position they have, is getting more scrutiny, is being forced more into the public eye, and where we're not seeing movement, we will vote accordingly. Um, but I still do think that a lot of people would say, if you don't like what management's doing, sell the stock. We have, of course, though, seen the real rise of the activist investor, which I think is another thing actually driving short-termism, because there has been a case of, if you don't like what management's doing, get management fired. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Which is something that there's now many, many corporate examples of where activists have had that, had that, um, had that outcome. And I think many people would say, which has not necessarily led to good long-term results. Um, and so we're going to continue to see that force as well. Um, but certainly we view it as a responsibility of holding the amount of stock that we do, um, that we exercise it accordingly in line with what we see as long-term good corporate governance. So here's my question. Mm. Since China is still a, a very, very active and passive in the climate change issue and mm -hmm. still in the, in the Paris Accord, so have you a bit adjusted your strategy in China? Um, in, yeah, on your investment? In our investment, absolutely. So we, we do have a business in China. To your point about yeah. opening up and market reform. Yeah, I interviewed <laughs> yeah. Larry. Yeah. All right. <laughs> our ability to um, fully participate in the retail market in China is somewhat bound by regulation. Um, <laughs> <laughs> somewhat bound. Um, to the uh, question of the role of government. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that is so, not yet an, a fully open market that we can participate in. But in terms of an opportunity and a place that we want to invest, absolutely. 
So, Koshik, the, the Tata group in India is older than the government of India, and in some sense, <laughs> even more venerable. Um, but is that only afforded by the fact that the group is largely insulated from the pressures, the short-term pressures of the marketplace, given that most of the controlling stock is held by trusts that work in the public interest? Is that really sort of the, 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 the successful model here, the kind of example of, of long-termism? Or is there a way to make capital markets work to have the kind of perception and perspective that the Tata Group has enjoyed? So I think it's a, it's a balance which has uh, evolved over the decades uh, because the holding company of the group is owned 66% by public charitable trust. And I think uh, they've been, over the last uh, century, there have been uh, billions of dollars which have gone in in education, health, uh, social enterprise, and now skill building and partnerships with various other uh, not-for-profit enterprises. Uh, however, the operating companies are all listed. For example, Tata Steel has got a million shareholders, and if I aggregate the top five uh, companies, there would be at least be about uh, eight to 10 million shareholders, um, retail, institutional, both domestic and foreign. I think uh, it is the long-term view uh, and the long-term strategy of the companies in the Tata Group uh, has been demonstrated not because, you know, you talked about Mr. Poulsen's uh, reaction, and uh, we are all part of the same initiative focusing capital for the long term between BlackRock, McKinsey, uh, Unilever, and Tata Group. Uh, and I remember him talking in, in New York two, summer, two summers back uh, saying that Unilever is a 150-year-old company and if my shareholders do not have a long-term perspective, uh, there would be a misalignment. And to say that in front of uh, uh, some of the largest institutional investors uh, was really courageous from him. But I think that's what exactly it is. I mean, Tata Group is more than 110 years old. Uh, if you really want to align the long-term goals of a business, uh, the institutional investor or the retail investor. And we've got second, third, fourth generation investors in our companies. Um, they believe in the long-term value creation without compromising the short term. So it's important to maintain that balance. I'll give you one example. In 2004-05, we actually uh, <coughs> ventured out to build a new greenfield steel capacity in a state in eastern India. And that land belonged to uh, the government, so we purchased the land from the government. And uh, when we went to uh, start the project, we found that there are 5,000 uh, families uh, settled illegally in that land. Uh, we could have used uh, force, which the government of that day tried to and created a, a critical situation. And we said, please step back, because that's not the way in which we would like to build a sustainable institution. And over five years, we undertook a rehabilitation program uh, to take these 5,000 families, give them alternative uh, accommodation, give them skilling opportunities, give them employment opportunities. And there would be investors who would say, are you a steel company or are you a social enterprise? And we said, we want to create an enterprise which will last a century. And if you have to do that, you cannot just uh, go in, go out. You know? And there are some peers uh, who had a similar situation and they just exited. They just said, we don't have anything to do. But we know that if we have to set something up, we have to be patient. And if you have to be patient, you don't undermine your current short-term goals to create shareholder value, but you have actually are looking at building institution. And if you have to look at building institution, you have to take care of the communities you serve. And uh, it took us about five years to, to relocate, rehabilitate, make them productive. Uh, we've given them training. We've given them, not, in our, not necessarily in our uh, our enterprise, but we've arranged training, we've taken, we've given them medical help, we've set up hospitals, schools, colleges, and uh, in, the, in three years' time, after this got vacated, we built an enterprise which is now up and running. And today we are uh, on the throes of making another 
couple of billion dollars to expand it. And, and that enterprise is a very competitive enterprise. So today we have a harmony between people who are uh, staying around the place, uh, who had once occupied that place, and, and us who are operating a uh, business enterprise. Now that's the harmony that I'm talking about, where you build and, and balance your long-term objectives with the short-term realities without compromising the short-term objective of creating value for your shareholders because you don't want to shortchange any of them. But there is a balance. It requires a mature approach, and it requires an approach which has a high level of empathy and yet accountability. So it, is, it doesn't come easily. It, had, it has to be built, and the entire organization has to be oriented around that same objective because you can't do this with just the CEO or the, or the, the, the top leadership team. It has to get, in, get into the DNA of the organization that we create, build uh, value in a particular manner. And then you are at peace with the rest of the community. Fantastic. Shuli, I want to uh, frame this question in the context, not as your role as you know, a, a leading journalist in China, but as a role as an entrepreneur CEO. And when you set up your company about <laughs> 10 years ago, you chose a very interesting model, right? You, in effect, gave, in some sense, an ownership stake to your own journalists. Uh, and you've created a, a very unique firewall between the advertising and the journalistic side of, uh, of your business. So could you speak to some of the organizational design challenges when you first set up your business and why you chose the route you did? I think it actually is a, uh, I think it's a common model in, in our counterparts, like in the U.S. or probably in the U.K. But in China, it's a, uh, very difficult for the market-oriented media to separate its uh, editorial side and uh, the business side because uh, uh, for the traditional media it is easier, but for the new one uh, it's very difficult because uh, uh, this industry is also under a very difficult situation. So there are not thousands of excuses to say, or for the co for the benefit of the company or for the shareholders. So we need to. Be very, we need to be very flexible, so there's no Chinese wall, as the firewall between the business sector and the editorial sector. And so once we started the, the company, Caixin, we were very determined to believe that the journal, journalists should control the, the, the organization to realize what we are pursuing for. Because, so we need to insist on editorial independence and never get influenced by the, at first by the advertisers or uh, or by our investors, because they we get fund, we get funding through the uh, uh, private uh, capital market. But uh, investors, we ask them to sign a contract to make sure that they respect the the editorial independence and uh, don't put their personal like uh, interest or because media is a way like you report one year later you criticize them. The God, oh, I'm your investor. I want to interfere. So we have them to sign the contract to make sure about that. And we set up a trusty board uh, uh, institution, like arrange, institution arrangement to make sure that every half year they review the independence editorial for us. And also have, then they also help us to uh, put such kind of interference aside. Hmm. Fantastic. Great. Um, yeah, right here. So just uh, one moment for the, uh, the, the question, uh, the, the microphone. And, and Thank you. Um, I have a couple of questions. One, uh, just sorry, this is, uh, I'm Swati Ramanathan. Yes. Uh, I'm from India, from Jana Group. Um, my apologies. I've landed yesterday and promptly fallen sick. I've concluded the air here is too, too pure. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, I just have a couple of questions, which is, especially in the starting comment that was made by Karthik, which was to say the deficit of trust in both the government as well as in capitalism. And uh, the role of uh, compassionate capital capitalism and you know what we are doing and what's the progress, because I think that's a great way to overcome, to say that doing well is also, you know, doing good is, is also about doing well. So that is one question. And the second, because so often governments are frankly, incompetent to regulate accurately. So there is a role for self-regulation. And here, how, have, how successful have our markets been you know, across China, India, and uh, in the UK, for example, in actually controlling the excesses of the market? 
in, in, in the self-regulations and in self-regulating. So these are my two things. One comment on uh, the one something that you asked earlier with respect to India, and, Karthik, and, and uh, we had a response from Kaushik, but I want to also say that the reason that India potentially has a greater level of trust, the Indians, in government, unlike, say, the UK and the, the US, is because of our starting points are very different. And I think that part of it is that the, there is, we are a, a government of largesse, of patronage, and of, uh, you know, subsidies. And that makes a lot of the people in a country which is majority 68% rural and poor, dependent on subsidies, farm subsidies, loan subsidies, etc., or on jobs, government jobs. And that could be one of the reasons why there is a greater affinity to say, to trust government. So. Fantastic. Do you want to take the, uh, the question first, Cheryl? Self-regulation. Yes, yeah. self-regulation. Uh, look, I would, say, I would say mixed. I mean, I can, I can speak only to my own firm, which is one that um, has put enormous emphasis on risk management. Do you know what I mean? That has actually been sort of the, uh, the, the tenant of the business, actually, that, that BlackRock is in. And so I think we've, we have successfully to this point, um, you know, manage risk and ensure that we haven't necessarily pursued. There are many, we, we see ourselves primarily as a fiduciary to our clients. So we have, and we're managing people's retirement money. We take that incredibly seriously. And so we have, you know, personally been quite restrained in not pursuing some opportunities that we would have seen because of the ultimate, um, the ultimate risk and, and, and would undermine that fiduciary status. I mean, it would be very difficult to be um, in the financial services sector and say that in the last 15 years we have self-regulated well. <laughs> I, 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 don't, I, don't think, I don't think that would be credible. Um, I don't think that means all actors have been bad, um, but I do think whether it's short-termism, ter profit maximisation, whatever it is, we have seen players in, in this and, and other industries, whether it's been environmental regulation or other things, take risks that are unacceptable in, in the pursuit of profit, and those things obviously have and should be um, scrutinised extremely, extremely carefully. Um, I think that ultimately it's going to be a balance between there needs to be a strong self-regulation code of ethic kind of approach, but I also do think inevitably there needs to be, um, there is a role for an external party, government, whoever, you know, regulators, etc., to play in that, because I do think that we need to ensure that the interests of the various actors are aligned, um, and I do think an external third party has a role to play there. Fantastic. We have a question from one of our MPP students who I'm trying to look at. There he is, Sai. Go ahead. So please introduce yourself, Sai, and then... Uh, yeah, my name is Sai. I'm an MPP student. I'm from the U.S. Uh, I was an engineer there. Uh, I have a question. Sort of I wanted to dig deeper on something Dr. Buckingham said, actually, about, the, about Exxon. Uh, you know, the conference focuses on those left behind by economy, and we've heard a lot about manufacturing and, and jobs, but capitalism seems to have failed the environment and, and valuing social goods, such as the climate, so what do you think it would make to take, uh, to, what, what would it take to make big corporations and the economy value uh, the environment? And should we wait for le legislation or is there a role, as you just said, for some sort of self-regulation? Yeah. Um, I, I would actually push back that I think capitalism has failed the environment. There is no doubt that we are actually in an environmental, in, 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 in what feels like a precipice on the environmental issue. I do think if you look at the reaction of in, my, in the, my case, the country I live in, US business over the last few weeks, to some of the decisions that government has taken about environment. I think that um, business has bought into that. I don't think that's just because of the social good. I think it's because people now recognise that you know, sustainability environment actually represents a good business opportunity as well. Um, and we do see, you know, for example, the costs of solar have now become, you know, now it's at parity with the cost of fossil fuels, and that's because there has been huge business investment in um, the innovation there to actually drive that cost down. So I'm not suggesting that business can't do more, but I don't think that um, business has completely neglected the issue. And I think what we have seen in the last few weeks is that very large corporations recognise that in some cases they can't wait for government because it will simply take too long, it's too political, um, and we won't get the outcome that I think the world so desperately needs. So um, I would say that um, there is more for business to do, there's no doubt. The reality is, is that business is a, uh, it can be and should be a leader in the community, and this is just one of the issues that they need to continue to stand up on uh, and be a leader. There's more to do, but I also do think that the voice of business on that, that issue particularly is growing um, as it absolutely should. Yeah, I, I think that's true because if you look around uh, post, uh, pre, even pre-Paris uh, Agreement, there was a huge uh, uh, movement uh, and 
self-realization across large corporations across the world uh, to adopt it on, on a voluntary basis. As we speak, um, we have a task force on financial disclosures, uh, which is headed by Mike Bloomberg, which has recommended the, the risk and opportunities of climate change be voluntarily taken by large corporations across the world and disclosed uh, for the benefit of the investors. There is a huge amount of uh, role that the um, asset managers can play, the corporations can play, and it can uh, certainly run ahead of any regulatory uh, changes that may take a longer time to, to take place. Yeah. So we have about six or seven minutes left. So why don't we take a couple of questions and then see which of those resonate with the panelists. And, and so let's just take a couple of questions in quick order. We've got one right here from Nazir. Can, um. Thank you, Nazir, uh, CIMB in ASEAN. Can I just ask whether we should fear um, the forthcoming leadership role of China? Uh, when I look, I mean, if you want to fix something, you shouldn't make it worse. Um, when I look at the Belt and Road uh, Initiative, I look at it, uh, it seems to be a lot of cheap money uh, heading to developing countries without very strong governing rules around it. Uh, and I fear uh, that we will wake up uh, with uh, you know, governments heavily indebted uh, to China. Uh, and some of the, the structures that are being used today are, you know, a lot of it is very much off balance sheet, et cetera, uh, very opaque. Uh, so should we worry about this, uh, particularly to uh, Shuli, of course? Fantastic. We'll hold that for a thought for a moment. Uh, Jolie, there's a question a few rows down there. Thank you. Hello. I'm Marek Prashevich. I'm Director of Communications at International Planned Parenthood Federation. But I'm asking this from two decades as a senior editor within BBC News. Journalists get a lot of blame for short-termism on the basis that we have the concentration span of goldfish. Um, so if you're going to try and fix that, which model of journalism should a government try and follow? Would it be the coercive approach, which we have in a number of countries, the confrontational, shouting at the news you don't like and saying it's fake, or the cooperative, uh, the kind of liberal media style of the Western world, perhaps, which of those offers the best chance of long-termism? Okay, models around journalism, and then we've got a question right here from uh, Yuli, um, just down that road. Thank you. Um, Yuli Tamir, Israel. I'm, uh, I'm wondering whether we're actually tackling two kinds of rationality, and therefore we are dismissing short-termism too easily. Because uh, for a lot of people, the short term is what counts. Uh, let's say for education, you can make an education reform. It will be great in 10 years. My, my child is going to school now. And you care about what happens now. Or I have to sell my stock because I have to you know, buy an apartment now. What happens in two years or 10 years is not relevant for me. So we are think, I think we are having here two conflicting kinds of rationality. And we should be thinking about how to really manage the conflicting interests of people. It's not that some people are just, you know, irrelevantly sort of understanding the system and they just want short term. They really need something in the short term. Fantastic. Great. Um, Shuli, let's start with you. Should we fear China? Uh, you mean about the One Belt, One Road initiative and with cheap money? <laughs> uh, yeah, I yeah, understand what you mean. I think in China there are also broad discussions about if there are money, how should it be used in a very efficient way? Uh, and also chi in chi inside China, we discuss about how to leverage this initiative uh, for China's own issues. That means further open up to the world. It's not only about the China go out to world to put the money on, but also how to open up. And in terms of using the money, we think about the cooperation, about a good, better governance, and a very pragmatic way. Uh, I think uh, I, we have noticed a uh, kind of like a suspicious and uh, uh, challenges, and we are the same concern with a lot of like uh, possible mistakes in the coming uh, action. But we think we're going to deal with it and finally resolve it. And just related with the uh, issue of the role of journalists. But yes, the role of journalists, I think, is very, very broad issue that you can talk from yeah, all the perspectives. But I want to give you a very specific uh, 
contacts in China uh, about the uh, journalism in, in financial regulation or financial system. Because in China, once we talk about the financial regulation, it's uh, probably different from other countries. In ours, I think at least three layers. First is about the, uh, the monetary policy and the macro prudential access accession to the banks. That is uh, the, the very macro measure issue. Then the, the more micro issue is about the regulatory bodies in China right now. They are very fragmented, and each each one supervises uh, like insurance, uh, banks, and uh, securities are separately uh, supervised while never cooperated well. And the central bank is kind of a bit frustrated in this whole framework. So, and the third layer that I want to uh, insist on is that uh, the should, just I mentioned about the should government be the, do the right thing and how should it do the right thing? Because uh, the mainly the regulators should be the judge, not the players. But some regulators are so, were, are and were so active to be the players, then it offers the, uh, the, the, the windows, the, the opportunities for, uh, for the players in the real market concluded with them and became a crony capitalism and become a, became a, has a coded business behavior. That, so I think for journalists, we, in the three years, we all have our loans. And the, but the, our main job, main uh, achievement in, is in the third hours, um, try to supervise and expose the possible case of, cases of cronyism. That is, that is a, a crony capitalism. That is our main job, uh, lower. But also we need to try to explain and uh, to push forward the further reform of the whole regulatory system and also try to explain to the public about the laws of central bank and the macro uh, uh, policies to try to stable the financial market. So all the three layers, I think, that probably can give you the example of a journalist role Fantastic. in our context. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Shuli. Um, Geraldine, I thought maybe we can uh, take the question on short-termism uh, to you, and in particular this notion that maybe some of the short-termism isn't driven by fragility in human decision-making, but rather by liquidity constraints. Mm -hmm. and, and how much of this, in your judgment, might, might simply be explained by that? Yeah, I mean, I think the first thing to say is that um, long-termism doesn't just mean spending money. Like, people aren't going to reward good money after bad strategic goals. Do you know what I mean? So, so I do think that, and certainly, I mean, obviously, my industry of asset management is one I watch very closely, and there have been numerous examples of where companies have announced large-scale investments in things like technology, and the market just hasn't bought it. They're like, this just isn't going to be a, 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 an investment with reward, and so, and so I don't want to make it sound like long-termism. Short-term pain for long-term gain isn't just necessarily accepted as, a, as an approach always. I do think that, ideally, as, as um, Kaushik was saying, you'd like to see short-term and long-term outcomes aligned. Um, so your, your example of uh, the, the families you relocated. I do think that uh, even when people behave because they need to do something in the short term, the examples that the, the, the lady asking the question gave, I do think that if, if bad, if, if bad short-term decisions are made, you will still feel some of that pain long-term and it will ultimately undermine the outcome you were trying to achieve. Um, I do think that uh, there is undoubtedly, again, we've got to be careful about talking about the collective and the individual. There will undoubtedly be individuals who short-term implications are very real. I mean, as I said, if you're investing for retirement, what happens in Greece or the French election doesn't matter. It matters if you're retiring next year. Um, and uh, because, you know, obviously you're going, to feel, you're going to feel market pain. So I don't think we can be ignorant to those things. Um, again, this comes back to I'd love to see uh, stronger social safety nets around public pensions, etc., to ensure that people have other other things to rely on. Um, but I do think we'd ultimately want the, the outcomes to be aligned. I just think that many short-term decisions ultimately, even if it's that you move it into investing in a, in a house, for example, long-term property prices will ultimately be undermined by short-term decision making. So, so these things do have a trade-off, but um, ideally we would want these things to be aligned as best they can. Fantastic. Kaushik, last word to you. Um, Britain today is a country in desperate need of ideas. Um, what advice do you have for British business British government and the British electorate, uh, given your experience with managing 
uh, a very large and successful Indian conglomerate that happens to be the largest ma uh, manufacturing employer here in Britain? That's a tough question, but, <laughs> but I think the um, I think um, Britain has been the cradle for the industrial revolution uh, for the world, uh, and I think. Uh, if you re really look around, the kind of talent that is available in this country um, is phenomenal. I think we need to create an atmosphere where capital would come in, uh, create business opportunities, and uh, leverage the talent that exists in this country. Um, the kind of uh, education and the institutes that you have in, in, in the UK are, are of global standards, and therefore, uh, that talent pipeline uh, can easily be created for many decades. I think it is the, uh, the facilitation role of the government, as I said, which can help. Manufacturing is one of the important levers to create more jobs, create more equality within the society, and uh, good, good quality education creates the capability to, uh, for good jobs and, and wider mix of jobs. So I think there is, a, there is a lot of work that needs to be done to keep facilitating new investments uh, and to ensure that the country remains competitive or becomes competitive vis-a-vis -vis the newer geographies of the world, be it China, India, and the others, because uh, some of the countries uh, like China are kind of the factories of the world. If you look at service center, service related stuff, uh, India is the offshoring hub of the world, and um, and UK has to compete against all of them to create jobs and meaningful uh, jobs. So therefore, I think there's a lot of hard work to ensure that investments come in. There is an investment climate for which stable political climate is important. Uh, stable regulations are important, which uh, which it does. Uh, governance codes and norms are. Uh, one of the best in, in the UK. So I think there are a lot of positives, and we need to uh, draw on those positives and ensure that um, UK can become a more manufacturing-oriented uh, country, especially after Brexit, and uh, can compete with the rest of the world uh, uh, and ensure that uh, the ability of the country to uh, grow faster uh, is demonstrated uh, for the new generations uh, of people in this country. Fantastic. So we've had so much fun. We've run over by five minutes, but we're going to use uh, the coffee break to make up. So we'll come back in 15 minutes uh, to the breakout <laughs> sessions uh, on uh, the future of work and income and on the societal role for corporates. Please join me in thanking Geraldine Buckingham, Kasha Chatterjee, and Bushu Lee.